apparently it's it's saying that it's streaming live already. Yeah, we are live now. Okay. So let me introduce for the pizza seminar this week, uh, John Peterson. Uh, John did his PhD in Columbia University in 2003, he finished it. And then uh, he was a postdoc in Stanford. And after that, he has been in Purdue University, first uh, as an assistant professor and then as an associate professor. He works on a lot of stuff. And today he's going to present some interesting uh, sim Monte Carlo simulation about how to, to build basically astronomical images with this simulation. Please, John, go ahead. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, um, uh, this code that I've been working on for quite a while uh, called FOSIM. Um, and it's, it's using this somewhat uh, crazy idea to try to simulate astronomical images um, one photon at a time. In the background here, this is not a real astronomical image. This is a FOSIM image. Um, so let me tell you all about how we do that. Okay, so uh, let me do a little bit of motivation first. Um, um, one of the main uh, purposes behind, um, okay, sorry, that was not our work. Okay, so um, um, astronomy and astrophysics has, has, has um, has developed for a long time with um, usually with the increase of precision of measurements as time went on. And this has happened in every single subfield you probably can think about. Um, it's happened in the biggest questions going, thinking about um, orbits of planets or the development of cosmology. Each, each time people make a series of measurements um, with higher and higher precision, um, they've learned new things. Um, but um, nowadays, the precision is getting very um, uh, detailed. And um, part of the motivation behind FOSIM is tr to try to understand that a, a little bit better. Um, so I've separated um, some ways of thinking about precision measurements into four categories. Um, uh, so for instance, um, weak gravitational lensing measurements um, require detailed shape measurements of all the galaxies. Typically, they require to um, calibrate the shapes of galaxies to fractions of a percent and therefore know this point spread function, um, the size, and most importantly, the shape um, and how elliptical it is. Uh, second category could be measurements that require detailed photometry, for instance, supernova, um, studies, um, planetary transits um, are often trying to get to um, millimag phot photometric levels and therefore calibrate the measurements very well. Uh, another category would be precision astrometry, um, where um, people use um, positions of sources to fractions of pic pixels, typically in the milli arc second range to get measurements, say, um, stellar par parallaxes or proper motions. And then the fourth category I defined was just, just anyone doing any kind of crowded field deep source detection where you're really concerned about um, how well Calibrate your background is, how well your photometry works, worried about things like PSF wings, um, and all sorts of um, deep surveys for both stars and galaxies and other objects um, do that kind of thing. All right, so think about those four categories. Um, in the orange box here, put those same four categories. And in the blue box on the right, um, I've separated um, some common image properties into two categories. So one I call first order image properties. For instance, um, if you think about an image, what's the background level? What's the point spread function size? What's the astrometric scale? What's the overall zero point? Those are kind of basic first order image properties. Um, then though, when you get to this higher level of precision, increasingly you're worried about these so-called, what I call the second order image properties. 
things like, um, you know, the wavelength of dependence of the PSF size or the sh PSF shape spatial decorrelation or the differential astrometric uh, wavelength dependence. Um, and this list is not even complete. You, you, can, you can start talking about these things um, and you know they're very, very complicated. All right, so if you try to match up which of these matter for the different of these categories, roughly um, the black arrows show, you know, all of them require a decent number of these and the, those, those really affect each measurement. Now, put those image properties over on the left. And then um, if you think about, okay, what kind of physics of either the atmosphere or your telescope or your, your, your detector or the design of the system, um, I put a whole bunch of categories over on the right. Um, and in each category, there's probably 10 or so things, um, you know, subcategories, but just to give you an idea, um, if you think about which which of these affect the thing on the left, um, it's basically a big mess. It's like almost every thing affects um, something else. So some of these image properties on the left. So, for instance, the PSF size wavelength dependence is not just one thing. You know, it's a group of six or seven different things. Um, some are more important than others, but um, you know it's quite complicated. Okay, so that's that's the motivation, and that's the reason why um, we've taken a very extreme approach to try to simulate this property. Because the thinking was that you, it's very hard to predict those image properties analytically or with a simple little calculation. Instead, you kind of need to simulate the whole thing. Um, to do that, though, is hard, and that's what I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about. Um, it basically, um, um, we're going to use two things. One, we're going to think about um, simulating these images by individual photons in a photon Monte Carlo approach. Um, that to, to make a literal representation of what light is doing when it when you observe it in an astronomical image. Um, now, as you'll see, of course, there's lots and lots of photons in optical or infrared um, images, so it's a little bit tricky, but it, it turns out to be quite efficient and quite fast. Um, the second thing is to try to simulate the physics of the entire system in as literal as way as possible. Um, so we've been working on this for a long time. We even started prototypes of this um, in 2004. Um, and as you'll see, um, the approach overall um, is very fast, but also it's very detailed trying to get all, all the details of how the physics works. All right. so. Here is a movie of how this works. So this is simulating the Rubin, future Rubin uh, LSST telescope. Um, and you see in the top middle, the, the turbulence patterns of the atmosphere slowly drifting due to the wind. You also see the <clears throat> mirror shape adjusting itself and that's responding to mechanical and thermal forces. And then here comes the stimulation of photons through the system. Um, it goes through the atmosphere, the telescope. Here it goes through the lenses and the camera. They turn blue there because it just passed the filter. And then we even follow the photons into the silicon of the CCD and you saw the photoelectrons drift. Finally, you make an image by just counting the number of electrons, photoelectrons that you saw drift there. Um, end up in each pixel. So that's basically a simulation of a small field, mainly includes a star and a galaxy. Um, that, as I'll show later, only takes a fraction of a you know millisecond to simulate. Um, okay, so that's just one one example. Um, here, I'll show demonstrate that this 
FOSIM can um, simulate other telescopes. So here's, this is the same sort of movie, but this is the wind telescope um, on Kip Peak. It's a three and a half meter diameter telescope, a little bit different size of meters, light still goes to the atmosphere, um, quite a bit of different optical design there. Um, going through the lenses again, reaching a sensor. Sensor is a little bit thinner this time. There's the photoelectron. And, you know, you still get an image of, of, of where the electrons end up. Um, here's a third example. This is uh, the JWST telescope. Um, you can see the adjustment of the hexagonal mirrors, as well as the um, very complicated um, camera design. This is the near cam instrument where you see the photons going through a, a bunch of mirrors and lenses and filter wheels, and then photoelectrons being detected. And once they drift, you get the, the image of the source that way. Okay, so let's get into the physics. Um, okay, so there's a lot of things um, that, you, that you could maybe notice in the movie. Some I'll get into, it's kind of hard to see in the movie. Um, but to do this whole simulation, you're basically thinking about the physics of light and electrons there on the right. In various places of the simulation, you're actually using different approximations to think about the photons whether you're thinking about a wave or whether you're using a geometric optic type approximation, similarly for the electron. And then with FOSIM more recently, we really concentrated on the physics of the, um, of the system um, that we're simulating as well. So not just the photon interactions, which is the piece on the right, but also the physics describing how the, how the whole thing Work. So for, in, for, for the atmosphere, we're talking about the hydrodynamics, and this includes both the, um, the turbulence as well as the, the atmospheric structure of the non-turbulent part. Um, you saw a little bit, and I'll show a little bit more later, the, the um, shapes of mirrors and lenses um, is very important for how images look and what the point spread effect function ends up to be. So we have a full simulation of um, mechanical and thermal deformation of, of optical elements like mirrors. And then uh, um, for simulating the sensors, um, when you saw those electrons drift, we're actually trying to um, simulate that drift according to electric field patterns. And so we can use electrostatics to try to predict how those electric fields look to first order, they're parallel, but there's often deviations that cause um, interesting complications to images. Um, all right, so there's a lot of physics. I'm not gonna step through all this, um, a lot of different pieces um, and it's taken a long time to try to, to, to get all these and then um, get, get them based on pure first principles, physics and, and not just resort to kind of um, approximate models for these kinds of things. Um, before we get into the weeds though, here, here's just, just to um, think about the more important things. Um, um, so of all that list, you know, if, if you really want to figure out what the point square function looks like, it both its size and shape, as well as where um, where objects in the field end up, the astrometry, in our case, basically that's where the photon lands. Um, that mainly depends on the, the overall optical design, as you saw in the movie, as well as these perturbations or shape um, distortions on the mirrors, um, charge diffusion in the detector and the turbulence. Um, and then if you think about the photometry or in, in the photon Monte Carlo method, how many photons you get, um, that mainly depends on the overall design. Again, the, um, 
Rayleigh scatter in the atmosphere, what the filter is doing exactly, and that how that photoelectric conversion works. All right, so let's get into some details. Um, you saw the turbulence pattern. Um, here's a better kind of movie of it. We have many, many layers. You saw that a little bit in the movie um, of these screens of turbulence falling this um, well-known um, uh spatial correlation function, which um, then rolls off at some outer scale where the, the turbulence is um, driven. And um, this will affect the photons propagating through the atmosphere um, and give you the basic scene that you get for ground-based telescopes. Obviously, you don't use this for space-based telescopes. Um, and then we propagate the light through the screen by considering an aperture, say, over that turbulence pattern. And then think about, as time goes on, depending on the arrival time of the photon, um, you get a drift according to the velocity of the wind times the exposure length. And if you want to think about uh, some other angle, let's say theta in some in the field of view, um, that's shifted over by um, a position theta times the height of the layer. Um, you do all that, you realize that, first of all, the PSF, including the ellipticity, is really dominated by how imperfect this averaging is. And if you get an instantaneous points per function, it looks something like this. Um, you can see both the image motion um, as well as the, the, the size and shape. If you average over a long exposure, you get something like this. You get an imperfect PSF um, approaches um, around PSF asymptotically, but, but for normal um, situations, it's not not always round. Um, here's some examples of what you can find for um, spatial positions being distorted or the what, 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 what could call that uh, astrometric differential distortion, where across the field things get um, slightly kicked in this kind of pattern due to the turbulence. If you look at the ellipticity of the points per function across the field, you get this kind of complicated looking pattern. Um, and the striping actually has to do with the wind direction. So we'd predict that the um, points per function would have more correlation along the direction of the wind. It's mainly the um, highest atmospheric layers that decorrelate your PSF where the lowest um, atmosphere layers basically produce a fairly uniform PSF across the field. Um, so there's a lot of fun things you can do with that to try to figure out how um, real images work. We also have quite a bit of detail about the um, simulation of the atmosphere for the non-turbulent part of it. Um, we have temperature and density and abundance profiles, all that self-consistently done. And then this is used to predict um, things like atmospheric dispersion, the atmospheric transmission, um, we have a full simulation of um, the Rayleigh scattering, the molecular interactions, as well as the Me scattering, mainly from aerosol and cloud droplets. So you can see um, bright sources like the full moon, you get, um, get this halo from Me scattering, as well as the loss of light due to the clouds. We have complicated cloud type patterns. This is um, air glow. Um, and all this produces some interesting correlations when you look at the, the variation in temperature and pressure and humidity. And it's also all responsible for um, a photometric floor. So your, your ability to really calibrate um, photometry is sort of limited by all these kinds of things. The very spatial variation of these things makes it complicated. Um, so <clears throat> moving on to optics, you saw in the movie pretty well that um, if you have some complicated optics, they often produce these very interesting looking point spread function patterns. That's just the design optics. Um, 
that of course varies across the field of view. Um, what you couldn't see in the movie too well is that um, on all the surfaces, we have transmission functions and absorption functions and reflection functions um, that can depend on both angle and wavelength. Um, and in some cases, we're actually doing ENM interference calculations. In other cases, we use tables depending on the instrument. Um, we can also do non sequential ray tracing um, in FOSIM. So um, you can get double and quadruple bounces, which give you um, ghost patterns for a bright source. You get this, this there for the um, LCT Rubin design. Um, and we've increasingly um, implemented more and more, um, more and more optical designs. So here's just some examples. Some people um, have implemented um, designs um, entirely um, on their own in the community. Um, but here's just some examples. You got various um, um, big telescopes, tests. Is, uh, um, has no mirror. Um, you've got uh, this is my backyard telescope. Put that in. We put even the human human eye in to try to think about that. Galileo's telescope. So this is just some of them. We're adding more. Other people are adding uh, many more all the time. The physics is very generic, so um, <clears throat> all this should work for any sort of telescope. Okay, another important thing is the um, the mirror shape, as, a, as I was mentioning. So here's, um, this shows you our simulation of mirror shapes. Um, we simulate, a, a, we do a little calculation at the start of the simulation to, to, to think about mainly mirrors, but it could apply to lenses to um, make up the, the mirrors by set of points and then do the physics of, um, the thermal and mechanical deformation of those points, um, according to a similar kind of um, similar to finite element engineering type simulations. Um, so here's an example of an optic um, where you change the temperature away from its ideal design temperature. Um, it, it distorts the thermally expands the shape, and then you can predict through FOSIM, um, the photons are coupled to that new shape um, and it distorts where they end up. And in this case, it just ends up mainly focusing the, the point spread function. Um, you can also do the gravitational sag. So you do the, the gravitational forces on everything, but then you support it by the actuator um, or the um, structure that they have um, um, underneath a mirror, you get points per functions that look like this. They have little um, kind of stripe patterns due to the um, due to the support structure. And then, most importantly, the one that's hardest to deal with um, in the real world is thermal gradient. So often on mirrors, particularly bigger the mirror it is, the thermal gradients last for um, hours, um, you don't necessarily know um, what the patterns look like. Um, so um, of course, many compensation systems try to figure this out, but um, here, if you put a thermal gradient, then it produces um, a very complicated PSF across the field. And this is what really often causes PSFs to be elliptical other than the atmosphere. It produces these very correlated patterns having to do with the, the current, whatever thermal gradient you have. So if, for instance, you put all these together, you get a distortion of pattern on the mirror from its ideal shape that looks, say, looks like this, mostly due to the thermal gradient. You get points per functions that look like this. And then if you try to adjust the actuators um, to to, to compensate for this, you get a little bit better piece. You can see that a little bit in these um, movies of the shapes. Here's one of just a lens being supported by three, um, three points. And here's a mirror 
where you basically see a thermal gradient and then you see um, actuators attempting to push on the meter to, to get it into a more ideal shape. But you have imperfect knowledge how to do this, so you never get a perfect shape. So that's the mechanical and thermal perturbations. Here, here you can see the effect on an actual field. This is kind of controlling the mirror shape manually. Um, here, if you look at the, the wavefront pattern and then look at an image, if you start moving, oops, if you start moving optics around, um, <clears throat> moves the field around, it, it changes the effective wavefront there, it moved it to make it more um, <clears throat> distorted, and then finally you end up with a little bit better image and a more perfect wavefront. <clears throat> okay, so here is um, the sensors. You couldn't see in the movie all that well, but here you have the photons coming in, in blue, once they get into, in this case, the silicon, they refract, because silicon has a higher index of refraction, that's the black. And then at some point, they kick out a photoelectron and convert, and that's the red. And the photoelectron, we follow the drift, and that drift has to do with the electric field profile. And finally, the light blue is where they reach the, the readout um, and um, land in individual pixels. So first of all, over, overall, that causes charge diffusion. You end up with this um, random walk process resulting in a um, larger um, points per function due to the sensor, uh, the, the thicker the device is. Um, you can predict that, depends on the voltage you apply across, of course, and many other things. Um, but we've been increasingly interested in the details. Oops. Okay. The details of this. Um, this is a simulation of the electric field profile, a 2D slice of a CCD. Um, and the colors are the electrostatic potential. And ideally, you, you try to make a perfect vertical field from the top to the bottom of the sensor. Um, but in this case, you can see two things we're interested in. One is uh, it gets very distorted near the edge. Um, that makes sense. Um, but another thing is the sinusoidal pattern is due to variations in the doping profile resulting in um, tree ring patterns, which I'll get into in a minute. So here's the... Um, Simulation of the distortion near the edges, near the edge. Um, normally, you can see two things um, in real devices. Either um, often you you get a reduction in flux as you approach the edge of of a device, or um, you get an increase in flux um, followed usually by a little bit of decrease um, towards the edge. Sometimes people call these glowing edges and these anti-glowing edges. Um, but in addition to that, in FOSIM, you can predict all sorts of things, not, not only the loss of light there, but you can find that the positions of sources shifts. Um, the, the top is with, uh, I think, glowing edges and the bottom is anti-glowing edges. The point spread function gets elliptical near the edge. Um, and then the PSF um, increases in size towards the edge. So that you can follow this whole, whole Hold distortion as you get towards the edge. Um, here's the effect of what, what what people call tree rings. So this is due to the fact that, that often when you make um, uh, silicon devices, when you when you when you make the silicon boule um, and you dope it with um, boron or phosphorus, the boron or phosphorus doesn't necessarily distribute evenly. Um, it has a different segregation coefficient than, than the silicon. And often, depending on the exact um, 
thermal axis as the boule is sort of spinning around, you end up with these kind of tree ring patterns in the, in the doping. So you end up with a little more boron, a few percent higher um, as a function of position. And we found that this actually leads to two effects. It's not just one. It does two things. One, the, um, the non-uniform doping causes um, uh, lateral um, shifts to the electric field. So ideally, you want an electric field that's perfectly vertical, but it, 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 it adds a little bit of lateral component to that. That's shown in the top images. And it also causes um, in a change in the electric field strength. Um, that's the bottom set of images. And maybe the, mainly the lateral component causes um, flat variations that you can often find, as well as the PSF ellipticity following that kind of pattern. <clears throat> and the positions of sources, or if you make a, um, uh, uh, astrometric distortion map, um, it follows that too. Whereas the, the, the other effect, the, the, the PSF size variations is caused mainly by the change in the strength of the electric field. Here's a couple more effects. Um, <clears throat> one interesting thing we can do quite easily in the Monte Carlo framework is think about um, the distortion of electric field due to charges that build up as you're accumulating electrons, um, you, you get a bunch of electrons in the um, potential well, and then those in turn distort the ideal electric field because they try to push the electrons away from them. So if you think, zoom into a given pixel um, near the center of the pixel, you'll, the electrons will try to push electrons away from the center. Um, and it really matters when you get towards the edges because then electrons might end up in a different um, pixel than they would otherwise if those electrons weren't already there. <clears throat> so that leads to two interesting effects simultaneously. Um, and we can predict both of them with the same physics. So one is the so-called brighter fatter effect where um, PSFs will get, will get fatter or bigger um, when you have a brighter source because there's more electrons there to push the electrons away from, from the center, central part of the pixel. Um, and then a second very interesting effect, and people have known about this for a long time, but now we can predict about it, predict it, is that if you just think about a, a flat and just illuminate a CCD, and then um, increase the intensity of the light, <clears throat> people have found that um, um, the variance increases linear, linearly as you, you'd expect for Poisson noise. Um, but if you go to very high intensities, you often find that you have less invariance than you would expect due to, photon, due, due to Poisson noise. And the reason for that is that um, when you happen to have a pixel that, you, that has a little bit higher number of electrons than the, the ones next to it, it actually kicks the electrons away from that pixel. So you end up smoothing out your image more than you might expect. Um, so that leads to a, a less variance than you, you might expect. You'd also do things like simulate fringing from, from non-flat chips, and we can do a full interference calculation for that. If you put all this kind of stuff together, um, you end up with very complicated wavelength dependence of um, flats. So if you generate flats at different wavelengths, you get quite different patterns. Um, the short, wave, oops, short wavelength is on the left, long wavelength is on the right. You see more fringing on, on, on there. You see more the effect of um, the um, field-free regions on the left, more the tree rings in the middle. And all this has to do with the fact that the photon um, interaction depth depends on wavelength, and then these, these effects depend on how, how long a distance the electron has before it reaches the readout. Um, so a lot of this, um, leads to kind of some interesting results, like for instance, um, 
Commonly, people calibrate their images by subtracting a bias, dividing by a, a flat correction, but this only really works for effects that um, affect the um, number of electrons you get in a given pixel. So effects that actually remove electrons, this correction would be 100% would be correct. However, as you saw, it's a lot of these effects don't actually remove electrons, they actually just redistribute it, like the tree ring or the edge distortion. Um, they end up moving electrons. So ideally it'd be better to try to figure out how to undistort the electrons first before you apply this, because only a few of the effects like um, contamination and fringing um, really affect the photometry in this sort of way. Um, so you can kind of predict that this kind of correction works, but only about half right. Um, it makes the images better, but there, there certainly are better ways to do this. Finally, the last part is the readout. You can put tons of things and different devices have all their own um, issues, um, but we have everything in there like gains, offsets, um, the whole digitization process, charge transfer inefficiency, uh, all sorts of defects like hot columns and um, hot pixels, um, read noise, dark current, all that kind of fun stuff, crosstalk. Um, <clears throat> we also have a complete simulation of cosmic rays, so we can do all the physics and self consistently. Um, so the charge diffusion that you get for the um, the normal photons, we can also do the charge diffusion of all the electrons generated. From muons, you can see that in these straight tracks, as well as maybe some delta rays that have been kicked out, as well as um, gamma rays, which produce these kind of wormy type structures. So we can do that for both a different distribution of cosmic rays for both um, space and ground-based telescopes. Interestingly, as we di did this, we realized that um, we can actually simulate UV and X-ray light fully and all the physics of the optics would work for that too. So, so we haven't implemented an X-ray telescope yet, um, but years ago I did a lot of X-ray astronomy. So we're thinking about extending to that wave band as well. Um, <clears throat> here's just some um, information about the software. I won't read all of this, but, um, but one important point is the speed. Um, it's very fast. You might think this, this is so complicated. How could this possibly be? Um, quite fast, but we can do about a million photons per second per core you have on your desktop laptop or even a large computing system. And we could do um, a couple order magnitudes more than that for the background photons due to some optimization. So this means that you can do a single object in milliseconds or in some cases microseconds. Um, so for small fields, just few stars and galaxies, the simulation is, is basically instantaneous. Um, you're dominated just by the setup time. But for larger fields, if you wanna simulate entire chips, um, that can take minutes, in some cases hours for, for very large telescopes. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, so the speed is due to a few things. One, it's multi-threaded. So the full calculation, if you have eight cores on your laptop or desktop, it can run eight times faster, for instance. Um, the, these have been um, algorithms we developed for many, many years. Um, and there's a lot of clever optimizations um, that we do. So the whole Monte Carlo method scales quite well. Um, and that's what gives you the speed. Um, FOSIM is open source. Um, there is a major release. Um, nowadays, we're doing, doing it every six months or so. Lots of people um, download it and use it. There's lots of patches in between the major releases. Um, and often, each new thing, we're um, revising or correcting or improving the physics and, and making it, the interfaces more easy to use all the time. Um, I'll show you a link at the end, but there's tons of documentation. There's 18 tutorials. It even has its own GUI. Um, you can run this whole thing on high performance computing as well. Um, so if you want to simulate large number of images, you can do that pretty easily. Um, 
and I think there's a order about 600 people that have used it. Um, <clears throat> so here's a few examples of just running it. Here, here's um, the fun thing to do with point spread functions. So here um, you simulate a star um, and then do what you can't do in real life, which is turn on and off effects, remove the atmosphere, add the atmosphere, remove perturbations, add perturbations. Um, these are all on different scales. The bar length is, I think, 0.2 arc seconds. Um, and here I've simulated in three different um, bands. So you can see the wavelength dependence of some of these things. So here is at a different place in the field. So all this is varying across the field. So you can see the dispersion and the optics and perturbations kind of being correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Um, so that's, you can really get into the details. You can even go further and try to think about, okay, how do each of these things, atmosphere, optic sensor, just group these together and how do those affect astrometry, photometry, PSF size, PSF ellipticity. And this is, you know, depends on air mass and wavelength and other variables, but there's tons of um, studies you can do like that. Uh, on the other hand, not, um, if you're interested in just getting realistic images out of FOSIM, people can do all sorts of things to try to um, generate catalogs, throw those catalogs into FOSIM, produce images, use their favorite analysis code um, to produce output catalogs, and then make, make a series of measurements just to see if they recover what they put in. Um, Here's an example of very massive simulations, just showing you we can do, do these um, very quickly. So here's arguably the worst case um, that the Rubin Observatory, which has a three gigapixel focal plane and is the highest area times field of view, the so-called Eitan Du telescope there is. So it's basically the highest photon collecting um, telescope that will ever, that, that will um, happen um, when it becomes operational in a couple of years. Um, so here in a given exposure, there's basically about 20 trillion background photons and 30 billion photons from stars and galaxies. Um, you can do that, both of those things, about 500 CPU core hours. So if you get 500 cores, which is not so hard these days, it's, you know, you can do this all in an hour. Um, and we've done, a few, you know, several thousand of these. Um, and this is the worst case. So it scales with area times field of view. So if you have a telescope with a smaller area times field of view, which every telescope is, it goes much, much faster than this. Um, and, um, you know, for depending on the situation, it could take minutes or seconds or, you know, hours. So. These numbers actually are often faster than um, very simple codes people have written with either no physics or li limited physics. Um, because even if you have a simple PSF um, convolving code, when you actually go through the trouble of adding, um, figuring out where sources go and doing the convolution and turning it into images and writing out the images, um, people often find that, that the speeds of this are, are quite comparable even though we have all the photon physics. Here's just some more examples. You saw in the movie JWST with its complicated design. Um, there's a JWST image. Here's um, the, um, the DS survey um, for, from the Blanco deck cam system, um, where um, here we tried to, to simulate um, uh, a field, this is the real data and this is the image and we're trying to kind of match. We make a catalog of this and then we throw it in a FOSIM and try to end up producing the output, cab uh, output image and iterate on that kind of thing. Increasingly, we've, I've been trying to play around with telescopes to use FOSIM in kind of weird situations. So here I deliberately looked at Capella and to try to look at all these ghost patterns. So. FOSIM is also fun for doing that in this kind of, because you can set it up in this kind of weird configurations 
um, that you wouldn't normally have for to really make good images. Here's even the human eye. Here's um, <clears throat> uh, the Mona Lisa um, simulated through the human eye. You can see the photon noise, um, the distortion near the edge, um, and you can simulate how that um, hits the retina there. So that's it. So um, FOSIM, as, as I hope to have proved, is is very detailed simulator, and I think it can really help people in this new era of precision measurements. It's extremely fast due to this Monte Carlo methodology as well as this multi-threading. Um, I'm always trying to collaborate with lots of different people to 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 do this on all sorts of different telescopes and help out on any type of project that. People are using this to either study results of FOSIM to try to figure out how their measurements work um, and predict kind of patterns. Um, you can download FOSIM there. Um, um, there at the link below, there's lots of documentation and wiki pages and, and um, uh, tutorials. Um, or if you just uh, Google or search for FOSIM Bitbucket, you'll find you should find that page as well. Um, but um, I hope you try it out and feel free to email me any questions. Um, that's it. OK, thank you, John. This was really a very interesting talk. A lot of, a lot of aspects of physics instruments all packed together in a Monte Carlo simulator. It's pretty amazing. Uh, any question? I have actually some, some questions just to break the ice meanwhile other people okay. can think about. Um, so about the computational cost now, you mentioned that it, it's pretty efficient. I guess it is also because of Monte Carlo simulation, so you can just split uh, each photon for a different processor. So I was wondering um, up to how many, how many processor it, it scales good? I mean, you can use thousands of processors and still scales good? Or? Yeah, so we, yeah, so there's two things. Yeah, I guess the two ways you parallelize it. I mean, one is you, um, <clears throat> you can, of course, farm it out to different, um, different nodes. And those can, you know, those don't even have to be on the same, you know, on the same computing system, but they could be. Um, <clears throat> and that's pretty efficient. The main thing you have to worry about about that is, um, the IO, because uh, often uh, if they're not read, the, you know, if the, the, the amount of data they might have to read and write, um, you would never worry about this on your laptop or desktop. But if you farm it out to a, say a thousand nodes, you might have to send a thousand copies of things back and forth. Um, so for that, it's pretty efficient. We've we've gotten the IO down to as little as possible, so that so that works pretty well. But then on individual nodes, you can use the multi-threading. And as you said, it, it, it basically, on each core, it can work on different photons. It, it's threaded like on, by, on the source level. So I'm, usually it will work on one galaxy and one um, core and another galaxy and another core and another star and another core. Um, but that we tested it, um, it's very efficient. So it wasn't always that way. Um, when we first implemented it, we had to change a bunch of very low level stuff, but um, that we've even tested it on um, these architectures that have something like two, I think around 270 cores um, and it's running almost 270 times faster. Wow. Um, now that wasn't always true the, the, on day one, day one, it would probably only run, you know, five times faster, but but you you realize the the bottlenecks of, of getting that data to the different cores, um, and so it's pretty close. You know, I don't know. It, it maybe not 100 percent, but in the 90s percent efficient on the, the large number of cores. So that's good if you want to get say one simulation back very quickly. Um, um, but also a lot of these um, high performance computing systems have lots of cores, so you might as well take advantage of them too. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. 
Uh, any other question? I have one. Yeah. Hello, John. So congratulations for this talk. I've been working uh, <clears throat> for a while on, on image simulations, and it's impressive and unbelievable all the things that Focusing does and in the time it does it, so it's incredible. One of the questions I had is, um, what, what was the most challenging of all the aspects that basically Focusing is doing on atmosphere modeling, optics, detector, that was the most challenging to, to implement? And what of this is also the most computing time intensive for all the different steps that Focusing does? Um, I guess, um, okay, so in terms of uh, challenging to implement, um, I guess the two, the two things, and, and these are probably the kind of two most important physics too, um, is um, the, the turbulence and the, um, <clears throat> the, the mirror shape distortion. Um, so the, those are challenges. The turbulence was tricky to implement because the, the prior to FOSIM, um, people often um, simulated light through turbulence by doing basically a full Fourier transform of the of the, the of the uh, screen, and um, that's uh, basically about a million times too slow compared to what we're trying to do here. Um, so we had to make all these very clever approximations to do refraction through, through the kind of mate large parts of the turbulence and then do the diffraction on the small scale part. So it was a very tricky thing. We had screens that are um, at four different levels, numeric, so it's tricky to implement numerically as well. So that was definitely a hard part. The other part was this, um, <clears throat> the mirror shape distortion. Um, which is very important for both ground and space-based telescopes and kind of dominates the pointer function. And I think we went through many, you know, I changed my mind many, many times. We went through many iterations of how to do this. We initially, we're trying to just parameterize it with kind of proximate models. And then we're starting realizing that, well, we're not really capturing any physics there. And we're just do, doing a circular type of engineering exercise or just Someone tells us the mirror shape should be like this, and then we make it like this, but we're not really doing it in the physics. Um, so at some point, I just decided we really just have to simulate the shape properly with proper physics. And then it was a little tricky numerically to couple the distortion shape with the, the light simulation and get that pattern to, to behave properly. Um, for and then every telescope is a little different, so so that was tricky. Um, the, the other part of your question, the the time. In a way, it's it's it, it, it at this point it's almost perfectly evenly distributed. <laughs> so we always we always any time you know we do a lot of profiling and. You know, anytime there's some part of the simulation that takes longer than the other part, then you kind of go and work on it and think about that a little bit. So it's definitely evolved as time goes on um, for what really limits the speed. Um, most parts of the simulation now are very optimized and you do a lot of um, calculation ahead of time um, for things and then do just a lot of lookups because of course a memory lookup is always faster than doing some computation on the fly. So a lot of the photon simulation is just, you know, looking up numbers and getting that photon to go through and predicting where it's going to go um, and looking up, you know, per photon, uh, you know, a couple hundred numbers for where it's going to end up. Um, and you know, there's there's there there is some computation. You 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 still have to calculate ray intercepts and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely over time, it's uh, it's changed. But if you really look at it, it's, you know, it's just like ten percent the atmosphere, ten percent you know some other part of the optics, ten percent you know doing this, 10, you know, so it's pretty equalized now. Um, but that's definitely changed as things have gone on. 
Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Uh, well, I, I have another one. <laughs> I was really curious about the eye. Right? I guess it's uh, is it is it very different, no, than other uh, simulators? So uh, up to which depth you are you are simulating? I don't know. You're simulating the retina and then the the propagation to the <laughs> through the nerves or how how deep you simulate this eye vision yeah so it's not it's not uh, it's, yeah it's not that good so i'm kind of assuming the um the retina is just um <clears throat> a kind of ideal detector that has this you know the the curved shape to it you see there um so yeah i'm not really simulating the nerves or anything like that it's just okay. just the optics of it uh -huh. you have the different um effective lenses and um the fact that you know depending on the rods and cones you get a different um um you get a different detection wavelength dependent detection probability um so we're main it's mainly more optical simulation of the eye I'm not really doing the the, okay. the nerves and the retina mm -hmm. okay well, but it, 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 it is in your, it is interesting because <laughs> You realize mm -hmm. how distorted the eye optics are. They, they're not, your brain is doing a lot of processing to make images look good. It's not a, it's not a really ideal optic in some sense. It's, you know, it gets very distorted as you get towards the edge of your field of view and stuff. Um, how long is the integration time of this example here? Oh, this is probably, I, I think I probably did the kind of typical human refresh rate of, of the, you know, one sixtieth of a second, they say, yeah. right? Um, yeah, so this, this, yeah, so this you, you simulate um, the pupil, of course, is very tiny, so then there's not many photons, so you can simulate very, very bright sources. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Any other question? Apparently not. So I think we can thank John for this very interesting presentation. And see you next week. Okay. Thank see you, John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks. You. Bye.